Okay, continuing on with my read-through of Dungeons & Dragons starter set, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, we're up to Chapter 3. Chapter 3, Cursed Shipwreck. This chapter assumes the characters come here before Seagrow Caves and are still first level. It also includes instructions to scale up the danger to scale up the danger in combat if the characters complete Chapter 2, Seagrow Caves, before coming here and are now second level. Shipwreck Overview Ever since the violent death of a gold dragon on the rocky shoal on the north side of Stormwreck Isle, the bone-strewn rocks have been the site of many shipwrecks through the centuries. One such shipwreck left a lasting mark on the island. About 40 years ago, a ship named, named Compass Rose, carrying passengers bound for the cloister, wrecked on the shoal, killing all aboard. To the horror of the cloister's residents, those who drowned found their way ashore as shambling zombies. Since the loss of that ship, each new shipwreck has brought a fresh wave of zombie sailors to the island's shores. Fortunately, wrecks are rare, or they were, until recently. Not long ago, a harpy settled into the wreck of Compass Rose. With its magically entrancing voice, the harpy has been luring ships to crash on the shoal and feasting on the unlucky sailors. The sailors who escape the harpy's talons end up as zombies menacing the peoples of Dragon's Rest. The harpy is only the most immediate problem lurking in the wrecked hull of Compass Rose. The greater threat is a cursed talisman held in the ship's hold, imbued with magic by a long-dead sailor's desperate prayers to a demon lord. This curse is responsible for the drowned sailors animating as zombies. Most of the sailors who were aboard the ship when it wrecked are long gone, but some zombies have been trapped in the wreck for years. All right, so before we go on with shipwreck features, let's look at this here, other shipwrecks. This chapter assumes the characters heed Renara's vice and search Compass Rose for clues to the recent shipwrecks. If the characters decide to explore other recent wrecks, you can use the map of you can use the map of Compass Rose to represent any other sunken ship's deck plan, though most of the wrecks are entirely underwater. Characters exploring other wrecks might find more zombie sailors killed in the wrecks who were animated who, who were animated by the talisman in the Compass Rose's hold, but couldn't get off their ships for some reason. They might also find giant octopuses. You can use the spore servant octopus stat block from Appendix B. Ghouls or other dangers aboard. These adventures are yours to create, but only the wreck of Compass Rose holds the secret to freeing Dragon's Rest from the zombie attacks. So you can play around there a little bit and come up with your own ideas for other shipwrecks that they might investigate. Maybe give your adventure a bit more length. Shipwreck features. The wreck of Compass Rose is located at the northern end of a long spur of sharp rocks and dragon bones jutting from the ocean waves about two and a half miles from the cloister. It remains mostly above the water held by the ancient bones that tore its hull. The wreck has the following features walls. The soggy wooden walls are aged to a sickly black and green. Algae and barnacles grow on walls throughout the wreck. Ceilings. The ceilings in the ship are eight feet high. Doors. The doorways are six feet high and the doors are in the same waterlogged condition as the walls. Light. During the day, the sun fills the upper deck and main deck with bright light and the lower deck with dim light. Sunlight doesn't reach into the hold, and the whole wreck is dark at night. See vision in the rulebook. Running this chapter. Dragon's Rest has a rowboat the characters can take to visit the wreck of Compass Rose. The trip of two and a half miles takes about one hour and 40 minutes to row. When the characters arrive, read this text. Waves lap up Waves lap against a derelict ship lodged against a ridge of rocks and enormous dragon bones. A faint odor of rot wafts on the sea air, 
along with the sound of screeching seagulls and the roar of the surf. A tangled mess of tattered sails and rigging hangs off the starboard side of the main deck, offering one possible way to climb aboard. At the stern, you can make out a gaping hole in the hull beneath the waterline. If the characters pull the rowboat up to the south starboard side of the ship, they can easily tie up the boat to the derelict's rigging and climb onto the main deck, area C1. However, they're free to explore other possibilities for getting aboard, such as swimming through the hole in the hold of area C9. Shipwreck locations. The following locations are keyed to map four, which shows the layout of the shipwreck. All right, so let's take a look at the shipwreck really quick. So here's the shipwreck. This is area C1. And then we have area C2 over here, C3, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. But we'll, re we'll refer back to that, but right now we're at C1, the main deck. C1 main deck, and you read this when, you ar when they arrive there. The moldering wood of the deck is slick with algae, algae and seawater. Amid the tangle of rigging, splinter splintered railing, and stray seaweed, you spot boots, bones, and bits of gore that seem considerably more recent than the wreck of this ship. Stairs lead to upper decks at fore and aft, and doors lead into cabins under those decks. The mainmast remains intact and mostly upright, topped with a crow's nest overflowing with debris. A staircase near the mast and a large hatch on the port side both lead down into the hold. All right, so this is about the crow's nest. A rope ladder runs up the mast to the crow's nest, secure despite the condition of the wreck. The mast sways alarmingly as characters climb and at the top of the 50-foot climb, the characters find that they are leaning out over the water on the port north side of the ship. The crow's nest now serves as a nest for the harpy that has made Compass Rose its lair. The basket-shaped area is stuffed with wood shavings, dry grass, and shredded canvas from ship's sails. Bits of bones, tufts of hair, and shiny babbles are also visible in the harpy's nest. Harpies return. When the characters arrive at the shipwreck, the harpy is out looking for another ship to lure onto the rocks. It returns after the characters have spent some time aboard, as described in Harpy's Return later in this chapter. Treasure. Characters who search through the crow's nest find a small gold bracelet worth 25 gold pieces, a single gold hoop earring worth 25 gold, two small tiger eye gems worth 10 gold each, and one bloodstone gem worth 50 gold. Four castle. So let's look at C2 on the map again. So if they adventure into this part, the upper deck, C2, we would read this block text. The broken foremast leans out across a broken railing with a tangle of rigging and tattered canvas trailing down to the rocks and dragon bones below. A rusted and rotting ballista stands near the broken mast. The ballista no longer works. There's nothing of interest to find here. So then we're on to C3, the quarter deck, which is uh, over here, still on the upper deck. Quarter deck. The splintered remains of a mast jut up from this rear deck like broken, like a broken spear. The ship's wheel is askew, dislodged from its mechanism. The wheel, the wheel bears the name of the ship, Compass Rose, engraved and inlaid with Mother of Pearl, though in the wheel's current position, the name is upside down. If a character turns the wheel, it snaps free of its axle and falls. If the character tries to catch the wheel before it hits the deck, ask the player to make a DC-10 dexterity saving throw. 
On a successful save, the character catches the wheel. On a failed save, the wheel hits the deck with a loud thud that catches the attention of the zombies in area C4. So C4 is over here in the main deck. A moment later, the thud is answered by a loud crash against the door to C4, which represents, which repeats every 10 to 15 seconds. C4, Captain's Quarters. The door to the Captain's Quarters is barricaded from the inside, though the heavy wooden bar blocking the door is half rotted. A character who tries to force the door open can break it down with a successful DC-10 strength check. And then once they're inside that area, here's our block text. The door crashes open to reveal two drowned sailors in a cabin that must once have been luxurious. A bookcase, half-collapsed, holds water-logged and disintegrated books and scrolls. The polished wood desk leans awkwardly on three legs. It has an ornate compass set in its center. The bed is covered in rotting bedding and sags in the middle. A jagged hole gapes in the floor beside the bed. If the characters drop the wheel in area C3 or need more than one strength check to open the door in this room, the two zombies are beside the door when it opens. Otherwise, they're aimlessly shuffling around the cabin. In either case, they move to attack the characters right away. Hole to the hold. The hole beside the captain's bed formed when the rotting floorboards collapsed under the weight of the captain's sea chest. It broke through the floor of the lower deck, area C8, as well coming to a rest in the hold, area C9. Treasure. Two small drawers in the desk hold a pouch containing 50 gold pieces, a set of cartographer's tools, and a dagger. The compass set in the desktop can easily be pried free. It, it is worth 25 gold pieces. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add a third zombie to this encounter. C5, the gallery. So that's this area over here. A long dead, uh, and this is the block text that you read when you enter that area. A long dead, headless skeleton sits propped up against a counter to the right but the galley is otherwise empty. Unless, did the skeleton just move? Small harmless crabs are crawling over the skeletal remains, causing the illusion of movement. So if they investigate, or they think that they're about to have an encounter, it turns out that it's just those crabs moving around. C6 crew quarters. So that's going to be over here, the opposite side of the main deck. And this is the block text that we read when we enter the crew quarters. Six double bunks line the edges of this cabin. Personal effects are strewn about the room, and a faded painted portrait hangs on one wall. The portrait shows a young couple smiling and embracing. Written across the bottom of the portrait are the words Aletha and Brastos, together forever. The black-haired woman wears a sailor's uniform similar to the tatters worn by the zombie, by the zombies aboard this ship. The blonde-haired man wears a merchant's fine clothes. Floorboard stash. A character who searches the cabin and succeeded, succeeds on a DC wisdom perception check notices a floorboard in the middle of the room that is raised slightly above its neighbors. A character who lifts the floorboard triggers a trap. A tiny dart shoots up, making an attack against the character. Its attack bonus is plus 5. If it hits, it deals 2 piercing damage, or roll 1d4 to determine the damage. And the character must succeed on a DC 11 constitution saving throw, or take 3 poison damage, or roll 1d6 to determine the damage. Once the trap is triggered, it does not trigger again unless a character resets it. If the characters figure out a way to lift the floorboard from a safe distance, the dart misses. Treasure. A sack full of 200 gold pieces rests in a small compartment beneath the raised floorboard. C7 mess hall. So that's down here. And when they enter this area, we read this text. A long table takes up most of this cabin, which must have served as a mess hall. Decaying chairs are scattered about, 
and broken glass and crockery litter the floor. Uh, there's nothing of interest to find here unless you as the DM decide to change that. Section uh, area C8, which is uh, the lower deck here, and this is what we read when we enter that area. The descent to the lower deck is chilly, wet, and unsettling. Seawater obscures the floor and sloshes against the hull. Decaying crates and barrels are scattered around, some floating freely, another stacked into corners. You hear splashing as a walking corpse lumbers towards you, wading in water that doesn't quite reach its knees. The zombie is an obvious threat, but another undead monster, a ghoul, lurks in the aft part of the hold. All right, so we looked at zombies in chapter one, so let's look at the ghoul, because I don't think we've gone over the ghoul yet. So here's what the ghoul looks like, the little art they have, anyway. And it says, ghouls are undead. Ghouls are undead that roam the night in packs, driven by insatiable hunger for flesh. Like maggots, they thrive in places rank with decay and death. The ghoul has an armor class of 12, uh, has 22 hit points, or you roll 5d8 to determine its hit points. It has a speed of 30. It has damage immunities of poison, condition immunities of charm, exhaustion, poison. It has dark vision out to 60 feet, passive perception of 10. It can speak common, understand common. It's considered a challenge rating of 1. And its actions are bite. It has a melee attack, which has a plus 2 to hit. Reach of 5 feet, hits 1 creature. And if it hits, it does 9 piercing damage. Or you roll 2d6 and add 2 to determine the damage. It also has a claw attack. It's an, also a melee weapon attack, plus 4 to hit. With a reach of 5 feet, hits one target. And it does 7 slashing damage, or you roll 2d4 and add 2 to determine the damage. If the target is a creature other than an elf or undead, it must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw, or be paralyzed for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. Okay. Much more cunning than zombies, the ghoul waits to attack until the characters are busy with the zombie. It hopes to paralyze a character with its claw attack, then drag the paralyzed character away to feast on while the other characters contend with the zombie. Unlike the zombies, the ghoul is not a former member of the ship's crew, but a vile scavenger drawn by the presence of decaying flesh. The water on the floor ranges from about 6 inches deep on the starboard side, the south side of the ship, to 18 inches deep on the port side or the north side of the ship. The water makes the entire lower deck difficult terrain, and reference difficult terrain in the rulebook to understand how that's going to change the character's movements. Hole to the hold. A hole in the ceiling in the northwest part of the area leads up to the captain's quarters, area C4. It's matched by a similar hole directly below it. The holes were caused by the captain's chest falling through the floorboards all the way to the hold where it came to rest in area C9. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add two zombies to this encounter. Treasure. Some of the goods in the crates here remain valuable. Using a crowbar, a character can pry open a crate in one minute. Without a crowbar, it takes 10 minutes. When a character opens a crate, roll a d6 and consult the crate contents table to determine what's inside. The characters can find each item on the table once. Okay, so on a roll of d uh, one on a d6, five bottles of fine wine worth 10 gold each, packed in straw, plus one broken bottle. Let me see, how many crates did they say are here? Some of the goods in the crates here remain valuable using a crowbar. Blah, blah, blah. When a character opens a crate, I guess it doesn't say how many there are, at least not on this page. Uh, a 20 pounds, if they roll a two, they find a 20 pound sack of whole cloves worth 60 gold. If they roll a three, uh, 10 small one pound bars of silver worth five gold each. A four, a pair of candlestick holders carved from bone to resemble dragons worth 25 gold each. 
roll a five, you find a flute with mother of pearl inlay worth 50 gold. If you roll a six, you find a spell of scroll command, see appendix A, and that scroll is sealed in the leather case. So they don't tell you how many crates there are. I guess if you go by the map, it looks like there's four. So I guess you could say there are four crates. Or make up your own number. All right, uh, area C9, the hold. And when they entered the hold, this is what we read. As the cold water engulfs you, a strange undersea world is revealed. Colorful seaweed grows over the shattered hull, especially around the gaping hole in the stern of the ship. Tiny fish dart among hunks of debris and cargo. See climbing, swimming, and crawling and suffocating in the environment section of the rulebook as the characters venture into the submerged hold. Fortunately for them, unless something goes wrong, there's no significant pressure on the characters as they swim around here. They can surface at the hole in area C8's floor or at the top of the stairs up to C8 to breathe as often as they need to. Captain's chest. A heavy iron chest lies on the floor of the hold, directly beneath the hole it fell through. If a character opens the chest here, a large air bubble rushes out and a packet wrapped and sealed in waxed fabric rises up after it. Though the chest is heavy, about 125 pounds, the characters can also carry it to the surface before opening it. The chest contains a pouch holding 55 gold pieces and three turquoise stones worth 10 gold each, as well as a pair of boots of the elven kind. The floating packet contains the captain's journal, which has been which has been kept safe from the water by its wrapping. A braid of hair is stuck in the pages like a bookmark, indicating the log's last entry. The, lo the last entry reads as follows. 19. Tarsak. Our journey is ended, though I fear... Our journey is ended, though I fear my own is to continue in the most horrible way imaginable. Compass Rose wrecked on a shoal south of Neverwinter. Many sailors purchased with the initial impact, and Aletha was gravely injured. As I tended her wounds, she clutched her talisman and breathed soft prayers. I asked her what the talisman signified. She told me, she told me love. Her husband waits for her at Dragon's Rest, having pledged his service to the dragon there. The talisman is made from locks of their hair, woven together as a promise to be reunited no matter what fate might befall them. It might have been a beautiful story had it not been for Aletha's gruesome end and the words of the prayer I heard as she breathed her last. For she was begging Orcus, the prince of, under, of undeath, to reunite her with her husband. I held her hands as the breath of life I held her hands as the breath left her, and I felt a horrible chill pass through her. Next, next I knew she was sinking her teeth into my neck. At the same moment, I heard moans begin to rise from the dead sailors all around us. What curse has she brought on us all? Already, I feel a creeping chill overtaking my body. I am securing her talisman with this book in my chest, in the hope that someone who comes after us may end this nightmare by bringing Aletheus talisman to her husband. The talisman is formed from locks of hair, some blonde, some black, braided together and knotted around two small finger bones. If a character casts detect magic, the talisman is revealed to carry magic of the school of necromancy. See ending this chapter for more about the talisman. Tarsak is a month in the calendar of the Forgotten Realms, roughly corresponding to April. No year is specified in the log. About Orcus. Known as the Demon Prince of Undeath and the Blood Lord, 
the demon lord Orcus is a friend whose power rivals that of the gods. Ruling over hordes of demons in the nightmarish plane of existence called the Abyss, Orcus yearns to transform the multiverse into a ghastly place of death. Many undead creatures, like ghouls, worship him or seek to bargain with him in exchange for some fragment of his power over undeath. A new threat. After the characters find the captain's chest, when they come up from the hold to the lower deck, they hear a heavy thump on the deck above them as the harpy lands on the main deck. See Harpy's Return below. Harpy's Return The harpy that makes its lair in the crow's nest, Area C1, returns to the ship when one of these conditions is met. The characters find the captain's chest in the hold, Area C9, and return to the lower deck, Area C8, or the characters finish a short or long rest on the ship. The next time the characters show themselves on the main deck, the harpy confronts them, and we read this block text. A terrifying monster perches on the top of the crow's nest, spreading its scraggly wings and screeching harshly. Its wings and legs resemble those of a mangy vulture, while its head, torso, and arms look almost human. It clutches a large bone like a club and flexes its talons. I can't remember if we looked at the harpy yet. I don't think so, so let's flip back to the monsters. So the harpy... The cruel harpy uses its sweet song to lure adventurers and sailors to their deaths. A harpy has the body, legs, and wings of a vulture, but the torso, arms, and head of a human. The armor class of the harpy is 11. It has 38 hit points, or you roll 78 and add 7 to generate your own number of hit points. It has a a speed of 20 and a flying speed of 40. Its senses are passive perception of 10. has... Uh, languages of common challenge rating of one and it has a multi attack so the harpy makes one claw attack and one club attack using the claw attack as a melee weapon with a plus three to hit and a five foot reach it hits one target and when it hits it does six slashing damage or you can generate the damage by rolling 2d4 and adding one When using the club that's considered a melee attack with a plus three to hit and a five foot reach and it hits one target And that does three bludgeoning damage, or you roll 1d4 and add one to determine the amount of damage it does. And it has this action, Luring Song. The harpy sings a magical melody. Every humanoid and giant within 300 feet of the harpy that can hear the song must succeed on a DC-11 wisdom saving throw or be charmed until the song ends. The harpy must take a bonus action on its subsequent turns to continue singing. It can stop singing at any time. The song ends if the harpy is incapacitated. While charmed by the harpy, a target is incapacitated and ignores the songs of other harpies. If the, ch- if char- if the charmed target is more than five feet away from the harpy, the target must move on its turn toward the harpy by the most direct route, trying to get within five feet. It doesn't avoid opportunity of attacks, but before moving into damaging terrain, such as lava or a pit, and whenever it takes damage from a source other than the harpy, the target can repeat the saving throw. A charmed target can also repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. If the saving throw is successful, the effect ends on it. A target succeeds on its saving throw is immune to this harpy song for the next 24 hours. Okay. On its first turn, the harpy uses its luring song in an attempt to charm the characters and draw them up to the crow's nest. A character charmed by the harpy's luring song thinks it's the most beautiful sound they have ever heard. It's easy to imagine how a ship might be lured off course to get closer to the source of this music. Talking to the harpy. The harpy is cruel and hungry for flesh, but it speaks common and can be reasoned with. It's not easy to convince the bloodthirsty monster to change its ways 
and leave the wreck of Compass Rose. But if the players come up with a strong argument, possibly supported with high rolls on charisma checks, the harpy cooperates. These tactics are the most likely to convince the harpy to leave. If the characters have already reduced the harpy to fewer than half of its hit points, it might flee. If the characters claimed the treasure from the crow's nest while the harpy was absent, it might agree to leave in exchange for returning the treasure. If the characters are second level and two harpies are present, see below, characters can play on the distrust between the two harpies and might convince them to part ways and leave the area. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add a second harpy to the encounter. This harpy initially perches on the ballista in area C2 and uses its own luring song. Although they're allies, the harpies don't trust each other. Okay, ending this chapter. If the characters defeat the harpy, one problem is solved. No more ships will be lured to the rocks, and shipwrecks will once again be a rarity. If the characters find Aletha's talisman in the hold, they can solve the zombie problem entirely. If they bring the talisman to Renara and explain what they found in the captain's log, Renara nods sadly. She remembers Aletha's husband, Brastos, but he died many years ago. He was laid to rest in the graveyard atop the cliffs at the northern point of the island northwest of Dragon's Rest. The graves in the little clifftop cemetery are covered in white wildflowers and marked with simple wooden slabs. If the characters lay the talisman on Brasto's grave, bury it in the soil over the grave, or burn it atop the grave, the wind seems to sigh in relief. Thick fog forms around the rocks north of the island. The fog lingers overnight, and when it disperses, no trace of Compass Rose remains. The characters might also disregard the words of the captain's journal and destroy the talisman while aboard the ship. This also breaks the curse. The characters still feel something like a sigh in the air. Fog rises up to engulf the wreck while the characters are rowing away, and the ship is gone when the fog lifts the next day. If the characters undo the talisman's curse, the next time they sleep, the cleric character has another dream. Read this text to the cleric's player. And this is the text that we read to the cleric. In your dream, you are once again on the deck of the ship that brought you here, and you see the Stormwreck Isle shrouded in darkness, just as it was in your earlier dreams. As you sail closer, the darkness breaks, and a dazzling ray of sunlight shines down over the island. A gentle plume of white smoke rises up from the island, as the darkness is driven away. Then the darkness and the smoke are gone. The light swells to engulf you as well, and you feel the love and approval of your God. Gain a level. After they complete this chapter of the adventure, the characters gain a level. If they visited Compass Rose before Seagrow Caves, they advance to second level, the residence of Dragon's Rest, let me start over on this. <laughs> After they complete this chapter of the adventure, the characters gain a level. If they visited Compass Rose before Seagrow Caves, they advance to second level. The residents of Dragon's Rest urge them to visit Seagrow Caves next. See Sea Caves on page 12. If the characters have already explored the caves, they advance to third level and are ready to visit the cliff, cliff top observatory in chapter 4. See Lost Wormling on page 13. The character sheets explain what happens when the characters gain a level. Okay, so that is it for chapter 3, and we will continue on with chapter 4 next. <laughs>